Welcome everyone to the 2021 NSS Convention. My name is Mark Wenner, representing our team, Karst Terrain Explorations. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share a small piece of history and some of our latest work. It's always an honor to be included, considering the fact that we're not able to be together. But we will next year. Let's bridge that distance right now and share our passion and excitement for caving and exploration. Grab your coffee and let's go cave. Here's some of the points we'll be covering today. One, I'll detail some of the cave diving history in Mammoth from the beginning of the late 70s till now. Two, archiving allows us to unify the data that's been acquired, be it survey notes or field reports, maps, photos, videos, and artifacts. Three, multiple agencies are involved in our work, so we maintain communication with all of them. Four, we'll discuss some of the radical changes made in survey and diving equipment as we've fully moved into the digital era. Five, resurveying everything that we map allows us to verify and update all data using the latest procedures and standards. Six, there's the opportunity to confirm dye injections, use data loggers, or do species counts using action cameras. Let's discuss the retrieval of lost ROVs in Echo Spring and River Styx in 2017 and 2020. Eight, we're giving presentations just like this to Cave and Karst Resource Symposiums, Tennessee Cave Survey, National Cave and Karst Management Symposiums, and to local grottos, helping to promote safe exploration and educate those who would like to pursue the same. Our involvement in Mammoth started on one particular Cave Research Foundation Expedition Weekend in which Brian Williams, Matt Vinzant, and myself traversed the upstream sump of Logsdon River to push some known leads and pick up where others had left off. Swicegood Avenue is lined by a series of dome complexes so many of the leads were soft sand, likened to sugar sand. We systematically probed each objective on the map. I walked down one particular lead following footprints that looked a day old, but 28 years had actually passed. Whoever made those prints turned around in going passage. Keep exploring. The influence Sheck actually had on the cave diving community can't be denied. He defined the word explorer. Sheck wrote the rule book on safe cave diving, and he's the principal reason the cave diving section even exists today. I can't say enough about how he shaped and continues to influence the cave diving community. Safety and having a good time. That's been our motto and plan. We came to the playing field with plenty of passion, decades of diving and caving experience, but sometimes that's just not enough. Everyone at CRF's Hamilton Valley's field station has tons of experience, but we soon found out they had something else. History, and tons of it. Sitting across the table from Roger Brucker or Patricia Cambises or countless other seasoned cavers spoke volumes about what we were getting ourselves into. It's hard to put my finger on it the first time around, but it felt like home. That feeling has remained ever since. With a cave like Mammoth reaching beyond 430 miles, Western Kentucky University being located just south of the park in Bowling Green, the stage has been set for this level of karst research. We are blessed to work with the best in all of these fields of study. With the Internet's outreach capabilities, we can coordinate our goals with multiple resource agencies throughout the caving community and strive for results. How can I possibly go over 40 years of diving history in a matter of 30 minutes? I can't. Cave diving in the National Park started at point A in the mid-70s and has cut a path through time to now, and for good reasons. This slide represents some of the dive project objectives staged in Mammoth over the past three decades and the work's associated timeframes. It all began in the center circle. 
the analysis of the Kentucky cave shrimp for the Department of Interior from 1981 to 1983. The right-hand circle represents the startup of sump diving for CRF, or CKKC, by Simmons, Skiles, and Swicegood from 1984 to 1999. Karst Terrain Explorations picked up their work, the upstream section of the Logsdon River in 2007, which lasted until 2019. Finally, the left circle indicates our rescue of two remotely operated vehicles, referred to as ROVs, in Echo Spring, and then got to push Accessory Spring in 2017. This chain of events has led us to our most recent work in River Styx, once again recovering ROVs, and finally penetrating Accessory Spring in November of 2020. Let's start with the initial diving work in the park. This was done from 1981 through mid-1983, requiring many man hours of logistics and research. John Holsinger and Arthur Lighthouser were coordinating the effort with Jim Quinlan and Don Coons helping to build this research think tank. It wasn't just the base drainage levels of Mammoth being explored, but included diving many of the springs in close proximity to the park to perform species counts and gauge the output of each spring. The gear the divers used at the time was difficult to transport to unmapped underwater passage. All this needed to be done in a logical progression and written up in detailed reports. This volume of paperwork has been scanned and uploaded to the Mammoth Cave server and then backed up. Our diving work for the past two decades has also been uploaded to the same server, an archive that continues to grow. The models we use to collect data has been well established by CRF, Mammoth, and other groups that need solid ground when documenting a project. Jim Bordham from CKKC, the Central Kentucky Karst Coalition, keeps all original survey books for CRF's work on file. With that particular field survey book number entered on all documentation submitted for the trip, a full trip report helps to educate everyone who picks up the next leg of the survey, along with all the data that's uh, collected on that report. Call it a one-stop shop. Preston Forsyth from Kentucky Speleological Society recently wrote an article called Who Laid the Line for an upcoming KSS newsletter and was good enough to send the photos taken by Sam Frischauer the night Echo Spring was connected to Echo River. The date was January 24th and 25th, 1981. 3,440 feet of dive line was laid by divers R. Fogarty and R. Miller and was tied to the left handrail on the photo below. There were also dives performed in Echo Spring by Steve Majorlean and Bud Dillon in 73 and 1974, and they were surfacing in the same general area. Very little was published about that since it was done undercover. Don Coons said the divers had snuck into the park and performed a rather amazing set of dives. Try to find any of this original dive documentation is very difficult and it really needs to be archived along with the trip reports from these historic events. Once again, no name divers with an unknown date for the dive. In the mid-80s to 1999, various expeditions were staged through the historic Roppel entrance and led to pushing 700 feet through the upstream sump of the Logsdon River and surfacing in dry passage. Four similar trips were mounted, all led by Ron Simmons, and included the likes of Wes Giles, Roberta Weisgood, Tim Payne, and John Schwann. You already know that we picked up their work and objectives from 2007 to 2019. Notice the dive line in the left photo that remains in Sump 1 since 1984, as we continue to use it to navigate to this day. Many dive lines from the past remain somewhat intact, but after decades they can't be fully trusted. The ROVs trapped in Echo Spring and River Sticks in 2017 and 2020 
we're all trapped in old dive lines. Part of us wants to keep that piece of history in place, as it does indicate the beginning and end of a segment of their survey. Common sense says, pull it all out and run fresh line. It has caused more bad than good, being fragmented, hard to follow, mostly due to the high water events that are in the system. Notice three knots in the tide in the line above. To some divers who find themselves in questionable visibility, the series of knots can determine which direction they are traveling, upstream or downstream. Ron Simmons set this line and used that technique. On the left, you see a simplified view of this base level drainage and the associated trunks and tributaries. As stated by Maimon and Ryan in a 1993 CRF newsletter, the analogy between surface drainage the dendritic converging on a master system and the transfer of water through a cave is often used when describing flow through a karst aquifer such as South Central Kentucky. Although this is adequate in relating the hierarchy and convergence of flow, this three-dimensional analog omits the fourth dimension, time. The photo on the right reflects one aspect of the complexity of planning and executing dive projects like we're discussing. Our windows for low water, i.e. registering 10 feet or a little more on the Green River gauges is rare, and even then can't be relied on. So what's changed since 1970? Uh, what do we have that they didn't? What are you kidding me? I'll explain a little bit more in the next slide. You were kidding me. Everything has changed in regard to the tools we use. None of these things really existed. Just check out the list, see how far we've come, and I'll go into more detail in the next slide. In the 70s, 80s, and well into the 90s, very little of this technology existed, making their caving and diving process much more difficult. Ground penetrating radio location, GPS map apps in our phones and laptop computers, with the ability to email what we have found immediately to the property owners or our cartographer. For example, loop radio transmitters use much more power and penetrate deeper through the caves are overburdened, but the core transmitters are small and convenient to secure during dives. We use the right tool for the job. Mammoth Cave can run 200 to 250 feet deep, so the loop transmitter is our choice, more capable and much easier to find on the surface. It can't be said enough. The use of redundant survey tools is a must. In case a Disto X fails, therefore a tape or a digital measuring tool with a tandem uh, sun toe remaining in your pack, all instruments are calibrated on a course and entered into our survey. Our helmet lights are non-magnetic, but nothing eliminates the issues we face with all the metal introduced by our dive gear. So, you might ask about cave diving technology and how far it's progressed. Let's take a quick look at what has changed in regard to our sump or cave dive gear list. Our digital dive computers are compass capable, track our gas profile, water temperature, and record our depth over time, really forming a profile of passage we just traversed. We are using analog compasses, record l -ruds, and counting knots on the dive line for distance, like we have for decades. There's nothing new there. Rebreathers have really revolutionized our diving, extended our range, extended our gas, but adding certain complexities to our pre-dive planning, gas transfills, and the use of 100% O2. The passages at river level in Mammoth are shallow, 20 to 60 feet maximum, which helps reduce the use of air on longer dives. 
Now let's leap forward a little bit into 2017 and see what happened in Echo and Accessory Springs. High on a viewing deck overlooking Echo and Accessory Spring is a kiosk which details a history of unknowns and plenty of theoretical conjectures. Displayed maps showing some of the first exploration with visuals of dye tracing done to track down the sources of water feeding this complex system. Nearby, New Discovery Cave awaits, perched under the same hillside along the Green River, approximately 800 feet from Accessory Spring, and its passage is headed to intersect with this maze and its tributaries. Our goal for the past three years has been to penetrate Accessory Spring and to confirm this hydrologic hypothesis, hoping to tame Mammoth. In 2017, Echo Spring was the first real opportunity we had to help the National Park and one of their affiliates, Mercy Academy, while gaining access to unexplored passage, Accessory Spring. The objectives were to recover two ROVs, repair the historic dive line they were trapped in, and then push Accessory Spring, if possible. Marbury and I have been diving and caving together since 2004, so he was a logical choice for being the first person to dive mammoth in 38 years. The ROVs were located close to the entrance of the spring, in shallow water. We had made numerous trips to Mammoth, but met high water levels and clarity issues before the conditions were right to pull off this safely. A small example of how difficult it is to get the timing right for such a simple dive. Well, we managed our objectives in Echo without a problem. Accessory spring has always been a mystery to anyone involved in the hydrology of Mammoth. I found it rather interesting that no one had ever attempted to push its limit. On this particular day, it was uh, something where I was wearing 72 cubic foot steel tanks for the dive that we had just made in Echo. The tanks were certainly too large for the passage that I encountered. It was a perfect opportunity to swim up the spillway, turn on the GoPro camera, and capture going passage. After I tied off the reel, what I seemed to have encountered was a pretty ominous breakdown pile. Couldn't quite figure out the best way to approach it, right or left, and what I knew was the water source anyway. The best I could do this trip was to let the camera get what I saw and to see if there was any way that we could get in there in the future. Every hole was the size of my helmet, which basically stopped me cold. But as I reached into the breakdown pile, I saw what I needed to see. It was cobalt blue. Let's fast forward a couple years to 2020. I know we're starting to run out of time and that's how it goes. One of our goals for November 28th was for Matt Finzant to push through Dead Sea just beyond the downstream River Stick Sump and run as much line as possible. Meanwhile, Brian Williams and I had suited up. We were going to take care of the ROVs needing to be recovered. Matt just blew it out. He returned within uh, less than an hour. He had run 1,400 feet of line, surfaced in a large air-filled passage. He figured he had surfaced in passage which had already been mapped. Much to his surprise and after reviewing his survey work, he had uh, pushed river passage under all previously mapped passages in the area. Pretty amazing, really. Since he was all geared up and in the water, the choice was simple. Let him recover the trapped 
ROVs. I think it's an alien. Survey in motion. Nothing is sweeter in caving than moments like this, with Rick Olson and Rick Toomey from Science Resource Management as witnesses to this magical moment. Those two are the primary reason we're able to do what it is we're doing at this point in time. Now that Matt had run his exploration line and surveyed out, he had a guideline set for the ROV removal. Simple. We set up shop and we do what we do. One ROV was recovered on the uh, River Styx dive and the second one was buried in large amounts of sediment and unable to be pulled out. We tied a dive line to it and maybe, with some luck, it might get uncovered by the next time we're in there later this year. We packed up quick at that point and grabbed dinner at Cambyses's. Always fun. This map reflects the direction Matt had taken downstream River Styx and the resultant line plot. From the time we entered the historic entrance of Mammoth, Dolly three divers worth of gear down to the base river level, set up shop, laid 1,400 foot of line in Virgin Passage, rescued an RV, packed, and returned to the surface. Five hours had elapsed. The following day was finally the long overdue accessory dive. It's nothing better than having a competent team like we've grown into over the years. Brian Williams and Matt Vinzant, they were on my first cave trips and sump dives and are invaluable when it comes to pulling this level of work together. I called them one day and said, hey, I've got a chance to do some dive objectives of Mammoth. Can you make it up here? They were here within a day traveling from West Virginia and Florida. This is a simplified overview of Echo and Accessory Spring with the nearby Green River to the left as Mammoth's main drain. You'll notice a couple features in the overlay above. The upper right blue line is Echo River and Echo Spring discharging into Green River. The middle blue line is the passage starting from Accessory Spring and trending at 105 degrees and essentially away from Echo River. The lower blue line is referred to as the low level passage of New Discovery Cave. During the dive in Accessory Spring I intersected a dive line where there's nothing mapped and I tied my line into it thinking I was an echo or a side passage somebody ran line into during exploration. Now look at the three images that follow. Electrical resistivity tomography. Go ahead, say that three times. The following narrative and three slides were gathered from the author, Madeline Lucas, and this is her Northwestern Honors thesis. This is in regard to ERT technology, which was used at Echo and Accessory Spring and seemed to coincide with our dives. Imagine that. I didn't know these people at all. And they found out that we had just penetrated accessory like the next day. So, quote, here I combine ERT with field observations and knowledge of Echo River Spring area to discover two previously unmapped water-filled cave passages supplying water to the Echo River Accessory Spring. This discovery demonstrates the usefulness of ERT in discovering unmapped cave passages in karst terrains and increases our understanding of Mammoth Cave's active drainage system. Well done. 
To further quote the author, Ms. Lucas, ERT is a non-invasive geophysical surveying technique which represents the culmination of advancements in direct current, DC, resistivity exploration. During DC resistivity surveying, a controlled electrical current is injected into the ground and the resulting electric potential field is measured. Different layouts of the current and potential electrode pairs, commonly referred to as the electrode arrays, can also be used to obtain resistivity measurements of the subsurface with varying resolution and efficiency. I've had a great time sharing this presentation with you all. I'd like to especially thank Matt and Brian for the unbelievable support along the way. Without further ado, Taming a Mammoth, one bite at a time. A cave system this large demands decades of investment in time and energy from the many people involved. We must stay vigilant to the tasks at hand and pay homage to those who have come before us and call on those who will follow in our footsteps. We'd like to thank those who have been helping us pursue this work, and hopefully I haven't forgotten anybody in the process, as there are many to thank. Take care. We'll see you at the next convention, live and in living color.